All right. The last slideshow stopped about 1999-2000. Now we have record group organization and manuscript organization that works. It's time to make a finding aid with appropriate parts for the time. I'm going to Odom Library, Archives and Special Collections, and I'm going to Indexes. At the bottom of the page, come on, we have our first examples of finding aid. Let's look at football. The first time we made finding aids, we did something that I call paper on the web. This was a Word document saved as HTML and put on the web. It had the ingredients of a finding aid. It had the unique identifier number, the name, the dates, the size, a scope and content. Now, when we first wrote our scope and contents, the first part was a little history of the organization of the football program. And the second part was our scope and contents of what was in there. We also have subject headings, some Library of Congress, some not, related collections, and an inventory. Four folders and a box that we simply called programs. Um, in 1992, I used, learned to use HTML to code finding aids in EAD. Here is the football finding aid coded in EAD. Now, when I've coded it up, we didn't have that many boxes, so that part was missing. But here is, let me get down to, where is it? Where is it, where is it, where is it? Okay, this is the part that describes the title, the number, the repository, the language, and um, later on there'll be the dates and um, the extent. But this finding aid is very, very long. There's a lot of extra parts when you do EAD. And we did it in Notepad then. We later got an XML editor and I used the EAD DTD, which sped things up a lot. But when you finish, this is what you have. You have code and it doesn't show on the web without a cascading style sheet and a transformation engine to go from XML to HTML. Our IT department basically shut this down when I asked for other support. So EAD was not for us in 2002. Well, I wanted to make online finding aids. Really online finding aids, not just Word on the web. I wanted to take advantage of database technology so I began to use Access Databases. Let me scoot this down. Um, I began to use Access Databases. At that time, Access would not go on the web. I think they can now, but it was about 15 years more coming. Way too late for what we're trying to do. Our first attempt at using Access Databases to make the web experience of finding aids a more online one was our Joyce and Joyce collection. This was a collection of books as well as correspondence with some of the main African American writers and critics in the field. So we decided to do um, item level description. We have a good biography a good scope and content note with series, 
The first is biography, writings, and publicity, and the second is correspondence. I'm not at my computer, so I'm having a little bit of trouble. Uh, items removed from the web. The fact that there's an online display available and it is linked here. Then there's subject headings. At that point, we weren't making the subject headings live linked, but within the inventory, there is folder by folder live links. Now what this is, is simply an access database table based on a query. You'll notice that all the query, the query was everything that says folder 14. This is correspondence with Gwendolyn Brooks. And there's the correspondent, the date, the note saying what was in it, the folder name, and there is no location because at this time, we did not make our locations public. We had our locations in a book that was listed by collection and box location, but we did not make our locations public and we still don't today because of security issues, but we use a system today and not, uh, not, you know, a book like we used to. All right, that was the first attempt. The way we made our access go on the web was by creating all the lower levels, like the folder information, in this case, the item information in an access database. We queried the access database, saved those tables, as static HTML pages, then we used the folder level in this case to, we created a page and then we linked to those things. So underneath this finding aid is a lot of other pages that it is linked to. So, um, Let's see. The second attempt was with Janice Doherty. Janice Doherty is a nationally known writer who is from our region. She was writer in residence. We have biography, we had scope and content, we had series. We presented subject headings and we made them links. For example, if you look here at correspondence, Madison Smart, you'll see the under correspondence, we've done a query and all the folders that mention her are here. And if you click on a folder like correspondence rejections, you have a title, a brief review of what's in the folder, additional information, the box, the folder number, and the date. Okay, then let's go on down. Let's go on down to our inventory. The reason this was such a critical collection was that there was so much unpublished material in it. Um, there was so much unpublished material in it, and then there was the published manuscripts and the published books. But very often, an author will reuse material, especially unpublished material. So let's look at short stories and novellas, Shorn Glory. What do we do for description? We have the title, the characters within the story, the setting for the story, a summary or review of the story, keywords, and any additional information like for the fact that there are two drafts and one letter. And then the box number and the folder number. The reason this was added value for a literary collection was because as I said, you will see things from unpublished novels then coming into published novels 
and being able to search online by a setting or a character can then pull up all of these pages where there are um, where the names appear in the different parts of the collection. Okay, that was Jenna Stardy. Um, the flexibility of access allowed us to describe in ways the EAD with its hierarchical description did not allow us. So we were very happy to use this at the time. We use this in a lot of ways, like for example, our presidential papers. Here we have a finding aid, we have a biography, a scope and content, then we get to subject headings, and this is not showing up very well. General subject headings and special topics, this is not showing up very well because the square actually extends all the way out here. I don't know, this is not my computer. Let's look at Board of Trustees. Now, the, there didn't used to be an annual report. There was a report to the Board of Trustees and these were kept in a minute book. So we were approaching our centennial and we knew there would be a call of these early minute books. Now they're scanned and OCR'd, so it's no problem, but this was well before we had the ability to do that. So what we did was for each entry by year in that minute book, we put like here's 1911, and this tells you what was going on in 1911. In 1912, there's a lot more things because they um, hired a president, so there was a lot more writing back and forth. In 1918, they mentioned that the college was closed against Spanish influenza. This has been used, and this minute book has been used in research papers on the impact of Spanish influenza in South Georgia. Um, so we've got pages, date range, a summation of each of what's in the minutes, other subject names, related collection, minutes, yes, it's an annual report, the year, and an ID that was assigned by the system. All right. We also were able to put links in here for example, special topics, Babylonian clay tablets. And this tells all the different parts of the clay tablet collection. But eventually, somewhere, and this is, we were able to put a link in to the clay tablet exhibit right in our finding aid. So these were fairly sophisticated finding aids. Um, Let's go down. So you've got your subject headings, most of which are live links, your box inventories, and if you click on the box, you get, these are box tables, and within the box table, you get the folder table. Okay. This approach came to its apogee with the Frank Reed papers. Okay, the Frank Reed papers looks like a regular finding aid, UA2-1-3. This was, um, this was our standard before DAX was to call this thing an inventory. Now it would be the Frank Robertson Reed date papers and that would be DAX appropriate for a title. Um, paper uh, dates, bulk dates, size. Okay, we go down here and we have a scope note and we have series. There is a series 
right here. If you click on it, this is every single thing in the personal and biographical series. And within these series, there are links. If the inf information is scanned out there, whatever, we made links within the series. And then we also embedded, ooh, this is bad. We have actually, I need to make that link to be to our vtext repository because that is an old page. But we have links within these old finding aids to digital content. We also happen to have a lot of, find, of subject headings for this finding aid because there's a lot of important people and important events that are documented in these papers. Here's Eleanor Roosevelt. Here is every single folder and every single box. And notice that this is spread out from box six to box 31. So it tells you exactly what folder to go to. And this will, and the letter to Eleanor Roosevelt regarding Southeastern Leader, Leadership Institute. Um, and all this, and then it tells you the names. Edith Bowling Wilson, Eleanor Roosevelt, Antoine's Restaurant of New Orleans, Buckingham Palace, um, and then related collections, date range, and the series that it belongs to. So our subject headings within this particular way of making finding aids are actually more useful than subject headings in larger, uh, in archival um, management systems because those subject headings only point to the collection itself, not to the folder or item within the collection. So this was a fairly sophisticated approach. Come on down, subject headings out the wazoo. And then, of course, there were your regular box inventories with folder lists. And notice that in box three, folder two, we have some of Reed's baby hair. Um, now, this finding aid was creating, created with literally hundreds of queries. So that top finding aid contains hundreds of links. Those links go back to a very specific directory structure of these frozen access pieces. Now, what's the problem? Well, the problem with this is you can't add to it. You need to do it for complete collections. And you also need to do it for collections that are important for some reason. So we didn't do a whole lot of that. This worked, but it was only worth it for important collections. In 2003, we tried MySQL databases. I found a student who could code, and we actually had a database with finding aids in it and was working when, again, IT shut it down on the server. We were using the student's access, access to the business school server to test it, and we wanted to put it on a library server. IT was furious. They didn't have the extensions. This was not something that we were doing. It was not something for VSU at that time. So no MySQL. Nowadays, five years later, after the school had the extensions, needed, we used MySQL servers for all of our indexing databases. You may have seen some of these. First, it's our archive space, but there's a link to vText, a link to the Valdosta Daily Times, the video database, the Campus Canopy database, the Scrapbooks database, the Southern Patriot newspaper, um, and the Equal Rights Newsletter database. So we use MySQL 
all the time now, but back in 2003, we just about got our heads cut off for trying to use it. Um, we also made an access database for our entire collection at the box level. What was his unique identifier? What was the name of the box? What was its location? And what are the materials that are in there? Now, we had this for the entire vault that's on the fourth floor with our archives. There were no unprocessed materials. You couldn't really search within the box as much except for that um, except for that little description of what was in the boxes that's off to the side, but we had no um, backlog at that point, but it was rudimentary. It was only able to be used in-house by staff. It could be queried, but it was somewhat complicated to do so, and our students didn't know how to do these queries. That was how things stood until Archon and Archivist Toolkit, the two open source archival management systems that were created in the mid 2000s came to be. Um, the next slideshow, you'll see how archival management systems were a real game changer. DAX was beginning to come along but our, it was only early adapters and our systems weren't DAX compliant until recently. Doug will tell us all about that in week 12 with an archive space demo. This next video is a basic introduction to the patron side of Archon and the difference that it makes. This is an older slideshow because I no longer have access to Archon outside of the archives and videos are done in media. Thank you and go on to the next one.